Okay, can you go to the um, meeting and see what you say? Uh -huh. Can you hear me on my microphone? You can hear me on my microphone, no. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, okay. early. And I'll try to be quiet because you can hear me in the back of your microphone too. So all I'm saying is I just want to talk. Well, you could shut your audio off. I'm, I'm muted. You can oh. just hear me. Mm. chirping in the background.
start and see if their background noise is my computer or yours. What noise do you hear? All of them. Then I can do it. I have to just talk. Yeah, you know? no, that's fine. I was just making sure it wasn't my microphone. Jesus. Hello, welcome. We're going to start in about three minutes.
Alrighty, I'm going to get started in about one minute, waiting for some people to log on. A few people are logging in. Just gonna give it one more minute. All right, well, welcome. My name is Michelle Steffler, and I am a, a local art historian and art teacher in Round Rock ISD, which is outside of Austin. Thank you for joining me for our 45 minute uh, presentation. This is an all ages masterpieces explained art, uh, art lecture. We're going to start here with the famous David statue that is. Uh, inside the Uffizi Museum in Florence. Um, this is a masterpiece by Michelangelo. It's a marble statue that was carved between 1501 and 1504. And he was only 26 years old when he completed this, uh, this statue. It's at 17 feet tall and it's carved from one single block of marble from the quarries outside of Tuscany. And it's one of the whitest uh, pieces in the world. The story of David and Goliath is a biblical one. It's found in the book one of Samuel, the teenage David has to defeat the giant Goliath. He could not be defeated by strength since David was smaller. Uh, so David, David only had a slingshot. To, um, to fight. So this is David by Michelangelo. Yes. To fight, <laughs> to fight Goliath. See, David was a shepherd, and you'll see in his, in his uh, facial expression, the natural trepidation he has for fighting against a giant with only a slingshot in the left hand. He does have a rock in his right hand. Um, he's unarmored. In fact, he's in the nude. Um, most artists depicted a triumphant David after the fight, but Michelangelo portrayed David right beforehand. Uh, this is the original sculpture, and as you can see, this is uh, housed inside the Uffizi Museum in Florence. There's also a large-scale replica outside in the town Piazza. Our next piece, and by the way, this is a chronological lecture. So uh, again, if you joined us a little late, this was carved in 1501 to 1504 by Michelangelo. This next piece uh, moves us to 1665 uh, by the Dutch artist Johannes Vermeer. I got a half a piece. That's all I got you. Oh, okay. Can I ask all the guests to mute themselves? Yes, there is. You have your audio off. Uh, Vermeer painted The Girl with the Pearl Earring in 1665. It's in the collection of the Marit House, or Matthew House, in the Hague Museum, and it's been here since 1902. So this is an example of a trony, which is Dutch for face or French for mug, and it's popular, it was very popular during the Dutch Golden Age. These tronies were paintings that focused on the face of the subject with an added element of fantasy or an exaggeration. There was a lot of use of props, especially hats, expressions that differentiate them from, let's say, commissioned portraits. Um, these are basically anonymous models, essentially doing next to nothing other than posing. She is highly recognizable now and is said to be the Mona Lisa of the Netherlands because of the innumerable crowds that she draws to the Hague Museum. Not much is known about this model, 
Some mysteries remain and everyone can speculate about her. She most likely sat for Vermeer in his studio as he studied her expressions, but didn't idealize her. Viewers are free to have their own personal interpretation of the girl. She may have been a maid or a nanny to Vermeer's 11 children, <laughs> or perhaps one of his daughters who borrowed one of her mom's earrings. Um, paint, um, pointing towards uh, the earring that she wears, uh, there is some say that the title is a misnomer and that a pearl earring of this size would have been tremendously heavy. It's more likely concave hammered tin. Uh, recently, they have st studied this painting and they have re the researchers have determined that the global trade that was available to the Dutch artist was pretty impressive. The lead white paint that is used in her uh, in her headdress was traced back from Northern England and was this particular type of paint was more valuable than gold at the time. Vermeer's uh, blue was crushed ultramarine uh, from the stone lapis lazul, which is may, was brought in from what is now modern day Afghanistan. And the red was created from crushed bugs that were native to Mexico and South America. Wow. Interestingly, Vermeer has only 35 paintings accredited to him. Girl with a pearl earring being the most recognizable piece. We move that. on to 200 <laughs> years later to the 1880s and to George Seurat's painting, A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jatte, which is, was painted in 1884. It took two years to complete. During this time, the artist lived and worked alongside the other Impressionists in Paris. A Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte depicts a typical outing for Parisians living in the 1880s, facing the shimmering river and relying on umbrellas for trees for shade. They appear to enjoy a brief escape from city life. Whether they're lounging on the grass or fishing in the river or even admiring uh, the, the animals that people had, one of which is uh, a pet monkey. It's not visible in this particular scene, but there's a dog, but, and there's also a pet monkey. Um, this uh, particular painting is uh, made up of millions of dots that are used to trick the eye and to believing that they are a color blend. So it kind of creates a luminescence or a shape where the colors blend together. Uh, oh, sadly, God. George Seurat died as a young man and there are not too many pieces attributed to him. Uh, we move on to uh, another piece that was created in the 1800s. This is one of several pieces that this artist, uh, it's Japanese Yukioi artist, Hakusai painted. This is a woodblock print and it is called The Great Wave of Kanagawa. It was, this particular one was published around 1830 in the late Edo period as the first print of Hakusai series 36 views of Mount Fuji. And it's uh, all, so Edo is a time period, but is also a current modern day Tokyo. This print is one of the most produced, reproduced, and instantly recognized artworks in the world. There's a mountain with a snow capped peak. This is Mount Fuji which in Japan is considered sacred and a symbol of national identity and natural beauty. The image depicts a large rogue wave threatening three boats off the coast of the town of Kanagawa as tiny Mount Fuji watches in the background, symbolizes perhaps the irresistible force of nature and the weakness of human beings. Uh, Hakusai began painting when he was only six years old and he was apprenticed as an engraver and spent three years learning the trade under one of the foremost Yukioi artists of the time where he became extremely popular. By the age of 70, he had produced 
thousands of pieces and became the author of the woodblock print series, 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Hakusai gained fame both in Japan and worldwide. Over his career, Hakusai used more than 30 different names, always beginning a new cycle of work by changing it. Uh, here he, he does sign his name on the upper left-hand side. Uh, and letting his students use his previous name. Some say this piece is uh, representative of the difficulties that Hakusai faced towards the end of his life. His grandson forced him to enter poverty by gambling away all of Hakusai's money. Hakusai also struggled with deep grief had, that he felt after his wife had passed away. Very well known Here is an American folk painter, Edward Hicks's version of Peaceable Kingdom. It was painted in 1834. Edward Hicks was a steadfast and proud member of the Society of Friends, which is also known as the Quakers. This particular painting describes a verse, which I posted on the right. It's a biblical verse from Isaiah 11. It depicts Advent season, peace to come over Christmas as infant Jesus enters the world and offers salvation. Most of these paintings are asymmetrically balanced to reflect actions taking place between groups of people and animals within the work. See, Edward Hicks was a carriage and ornamental painter by trade. He had a very steady hand, which was ideal for lettering and quoting passages, which were often seen in his paintings. Hicks almost always painted outdoor scenes in which the light source is the sky or the sun. He became extremely faithful to his religion and was married with five children to support. He wrote an autobiography in 1851 where Hicks spoke of his financial struggles and his struggles to align uh, and uh, his artistic impulses in a faith that uh, discouraged creativity. In the Quaker religion, there really wasn't, uh, there wasn't an emphasis on the ornamental or the beauty I say, no, of art. I'm surprised that he was even painting. Several seasons converge into one hopeful seas scene using what artists call atmospheric perspective. And that is when an artist uses darker colors in the foreground and lighter, usually cooler colors and with less detail in the background to increase the illusion of depth. Here we see 14 animals looking alert, yet serene, being directed by children. On the upper right, you have the boy child Jesus Christ leading a lioness. He's born to reconcile all creation to God. See, Quakers believe that there is a direct relationship between God and each believer. Every human being uh, contains something of God. This is often called in their religion, the light of God. So Quakers regard all human beings as equal and equally worthy of respect. Quakers accept that all human beings contain goodness and truth. Quakers don't do dogma. In fact, the closest thing to dogma that they do is pacifism. They practice pacifism. So that will help you understand this next piece of this. So we have the 14 animals and these children here. And to the, in the back, in the rear, is a grouping of people. This depicts a treaty negotiation that took place about 100 years earlier in 1737. The native Lenope tribe, which is the tribe of Native Americans out of Delaware, agreed to sell 
all the land that a man could walk in a day and a half to historical American William Penn, which you might know that name from Pennsylvania. So the Lenope tribe agrees to sell this land to William Penn, the amount of land that a man could walk in a day and a half. Well, there was a little bit of a, of a, of a cheat going on. Penn hired a team of skilled runners to complete the walk, quote unquote walk, on a prepared trail. So essentially they cheat. The colonial government under Penn measured out a track much larger than the Lenope tribe had originally intended to sell, roughly 1,200 square miles. In this painting, Edward Hicks depicts imperfection at human attempts at peace. This version, one of 62 similar paintings, is now housed at the National Gallery of Art. Edward Hicks uh, refused to make any money off of these paintings. He gave them away for free. And as I said, there's about 62 different versions of, of this particular painting. Only 37 years old when he died and having sold only one painting, Vincent van Gogh sadly did not live long enough to see the extent of his legacy, which includes now being one of the most expensive in the world. See, he was an obsessive worker and painted almost 900 paintings in 10 years. While it's fairly well known that Van Gogh lived with a mental illness, we can't be 100% certain around the details. What is fairly well understood though, is his symptoms included hallucinations, depression, and seizures, which had sometimes became quite severe. In fact, he was uh, even institutionalized for a time period where he created his famous Starry Night painting. Many modern day psychiatrists have attempted to diagnose this illness with the by the symptoms that he displayed. Possible diagnosis is have included schizophrenia or bipolar, uh, effects from syphilis, hypergraphia, Gersh Gershwin syndrome, or temporal lobe epilepsy. It's quite possible that he had a combination of, of these. Here you see Vincent van Gogh with his ear bandaged. The story goes that Van Gogh and his roommate, another artist named Paul Gauguin, who we will see in a bit, we will see some of Paul Gauguin's art, they were having a quarrel. See, Gauguin lived with Vincent Van Gogh briefly during a very desperate and destitute time. They lived in a town uh, uh, in France called Arles, A-R-L-E-S. Uh, they got into a quarrel and the argument got more and more heated until Van Gogh threatened Gauguin with a razor. But instead of actually harming Paul Gauguin, Vincent Van Gogh sliced a piece of his own earlobe. He wrapped it in a cloth and later he gave that earlobe to a local woman that he sort of um, had this uh, obsession with or crush a woman of the streets, um, he, he presented her with this box that had his earlobe in it with a note that said, if you won't take all of me, will you take a piece of me? Which uh, of course did not work, she was uninterested. And this particular self-portrait that Van Gogh paints shows this painful episode during his life. This next artist, uh, is the French Impressionist artist Paul Gauguin that I just talked about. Uh, this particular painting is read uh, in the upper left-hand corner. It is translated at, to English uh, from French as where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? And it, it was painted in 1897. It's located in the Fine Art Museum of Boston, which ironically, uh, Gauguin traveled all around the world, but never to the United States. 
Gauguin traveled, uh, he was a, a, a complicated artist who traveled often. He was in despair when he undertook this painting in 1897, mourning the death of his estranged daughter earlier in the year, oppressed by heavy debts. He used every penny and cashed in every favor to purchase oil paint and used uh, gunny sacks, which was like a potato sack or burlap bags sewn together for this giant mural. Representative of his post-impressionistic style, there's thick brushstroke, vivid, saturated, colorful, bold, and unapologetic work. Read from right to left, so there's a little bit of a change here. His particular art is read from right to left. It starts with a dog, a black dog that we can see is half visible. This dog represents Paul Gauguin himself observing life uh, uh, from the and being an outsider observing in. The nearby baby signifies the beginning of life, the hopefulness. The figure whose back is turned to the viewer could be understood as the beginning of one individual's realization with gender, a symbol of life and innocence surrounded by three Tahitian young women. At the center of a composition, we see this androgynous figure reaching for an apple from the tree of life that symbolizes temptation. Gauguin pointed at primitivism, mystery and innocence. An idol to the left, moving along, its hands mysteriously raised seems to indicate the beyond. And lastly, we see an old woman to the left ne next to these, uh, these, oh, these animals, a middle-aged woman and an older woman that uh, in, is painted in dark, deep, mood blue tones, high contrast, and an animal symbolizing perhaps rebirth or re rejuvenation. A little bit about the artist. After graduating from Naval Prep School, he drifted into the finance, uh, finance uh, profession and became a stockbroker by the age of 18. Uh, he lost everything when the stock market crashed in 1882 decided to pursue art as a full-time career. Paul Gauguin married a Dutch woman who bore him five children. Um, his forever roaming eye and fantasies of travel made fidelity complicated. And in 1885, he abandoned it all. Um, he was not a religious, but very spiritual man. And in his letters to friends back in Paris, he compares himself to martyrs rift with torment and heightened romanticism, which I like to call fantastical fibs. Um, just to reiterate what I said on the other slide of Vincent van Gogh, he did briefly uh, live with Vincent van Gogh, basically uh, in a desperate, and as I said, destitute time. Vincent van Gogh's brother Theo, uh, who worked as an art dealer, uh, convinced Gauguin to basically do him a favor by living with Vincent and it didn't last all but uh, three or four months. Um, uh, Gauguin left his family, uh, his children, his wife, and he left France and he traveled by boat all the way to the Marquis Islands and French Polynesian Islands where he was horrified at the French colonialism and the missionaries uh, that were taking over the islands and uh, really reverted into the rural parts of the island um, where he convinced a family to let him marry their 14 year old daughter and uh, really for the rest of his life um, created more children, uh, married several times and uh, died a, a bohemian lifestyle, a painful, he died a painful death, an early death, um, some attribute it to the effects of advanced um, syphilis. So um, sort of a rough and tormented artist. 
We move on to a very famous piece on the left titled The American Gothic. It's often parodied. It's a painting that was uh, created by an artist named Grant Wood in the 1930s. He was an American artist. This is very much a Midwestern scene. Grant Wood himself was uh, a Midwestern silversmith, camouflage artist, stained glass muralist, and art teacher, eventual, an eventual uh, professor of art. So he had a lot of, wore a lot of hats. Um, this style is American regionalism, usually tethered to scenes of the American Midwest landscapes, propagating the prevailing American spirit of resilience, living a productive, industrious, and moralistic lifestyle. The figures are a father and daughter, it's often thought of as husband and wife, but it was not. It is actually father and daughter. And you'll notice immediately the gender stereotyping with the woman closer to the house in an apron, a man holding a pitchfork, uh, which indicates a work, manual labor. The woman is, the daughter is behind the man. Dad is very stern, probably Christian, and stands for traditional values. The daughter, most likely a spinster, stares into the distance, off center, not at the viewer. Perhaps she yearns for more in her future. The architecture here is Greek Revival, which is also called Carpenter Gothic, meaning they used wood instead of Gothic stone that they use in the Gothic architecture in Europe. So again, this is a re architecture is called Greek Revival or Carpenter Gothic. And that means that they were using wood in their Gothic architecture rather than the stone that they used in Europe. Grant Wood studied in Europe for, he made four trips there in a span of 10 years. He studied the great masters. This is a real home in Iowa. It's now a museum. And these two models were Grant's sister, Nan, and his dentist, believe it or not. His dentist was a model for this very famous painting. Uh, the patterns repeat in the apron uh, and they repeat in the curtain uh, in the window. The pitchfork repeats itself in the man's overalls which is sort of a visual device that artists use to keep the eye moving, to sort of repeat patterns throughout a piece. Um, the amorphous trees that Grant Wood is kind of known for, these round blobs. And again, the atmospheric perspective, which I'll remind you is darker colors in the foreground, lighter, cooler colors in the background, that are less detailed, there is no detail in the sky here, that's called atmospheric perspective. Grant Wood was 40 years old when he won $300 from a contest that the Art Institute of Chicago had put on. And uh, so he won $300 and his artwork is permanently displayed there in their, in their collection. Uh, he taught, Grant Wood taught at the University of Iowa um, until his cancer diagnosis, he left his position at the college and uh, sadly he died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 51. This next piece is very meaty, very interesting. It's painted by Spanish national Pablo Picasso. The title of this piece is Guernica. See, Pablo Picasso, he was born in Spain, but lived most of his life in Paris, France. When this was painted, Picasso was mid-career, middle-aged, and extremely famous with a bold, salacious reputation. This painting of Guernica depicts suffering of people, animals, and buildings wrenched by violence and chaos. This painting was inspired 
by uh, the shock and the grief and the horror at the Nazi German bombing of the town of Guernica, Spain in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. After the bombing, he was commissioned to create this huge wall mural for a display at the 1937 World's Fair in Paris. This mural presents a scene of brutality, helplessness, and suffering with its high contrast and newspaper-like graphic. I'm gonna walk you through it. So starting on the upper left, there's a large bull symbolizing fertility, virility, strength, and the Spanish nationalism, being that the Spanish uh, have a sport of bullfighting. This is, a, this is a direct symbol for the Spanish patriotism, Spanish people. The, above the, above the, uh, the, the bull standing above a woman who cries in anguish as she holds her deceased child. A soldier lies dead on the ground, his body as broken as the sword that he holds. In the center, there's a horse that is pierced by a spike. He begins to collapse. There's a large wound in his side. An electric light burns above his head. A woman leans out a window, holding a lantern lit by a flame. Another woman with a distorted gaze at the lantern uh, uh, lurches through a door. A third woman with her hands raised screams in horror as flames erupt around her. There is a flower growing right near the soldier's hand, which symbolizes hope. During his career, Picasso had oftentimes created paintings with a limited palette. Here are two examples of paintings that he created in his early 20s when he first moved to Paris from Spain. He almost exclusively used blue. Thus, this period is titled the Blue Period. It's a very painful and traumatic time of great personal loss for the young Picasso. He switches later to a more rosier, uh, more red, more pink hues during his rose period. This monochromatic color scheme is purposeful and powerful. As he sketched Guernica, Picasso experimented with the strategic use of other colors. For example, at one point, the wailing mother cried a red tear. In other places, he intended to use scraps of collage. In the end, he did away with all of this. Picasso was approached by a, a German officer during the Nazi-occupied Paris, uh, during what well, he lived in an apartment. And uh, when the German officer saw this painting, he said, did you do that? And Picasso responded, no, you did. This painting is currently located in the Queen Sophia Museum in Madrid, Spain, but it wasn't always there. Picasso was adamant that the Guernica painting remain at the Museum of Modern Art in New York until Spain re-established a dem democratic republic. And that wasn't until 1981, when after both the artist and the Franco death, that Span Spanish negotiators were finally able to bring the mural home. I'm wrapping up with a few more pieces. Uh, this moves us into abstract expressionism by a New York-based artist named Jackson Pollock, who painted this abstract masterpiece titled Convergence in 1952 at the height of his popularity. But it was quickly overshadowed by another painting he had just finished titled Blue Poles, which I'll show you here. This is titled Blue Poles, which became one of his most uh, acclaimed paintings over his short career. 
Between 1951 and 1953, Pollock shifted away from the colorful, impulsive, abstract drip paintings using oil-based house paint that made him famous. Action painting changed history. Large white canvases were stretched out and he splattered black paint, almost like cobwebs. His abstract expressionist style and non-representational paintings uh, developed during his signature drip technique were symbols and gestures of a mind processing pain and fear. In fact, he was nicknamed Jack the Dripper. Gestures of tension, beauty, distress in the art piece is why this painting is so successful with its various colors and confusion. Even frustration and anger. Um, Pollock was a, a, an alcoholic who was in a marriage with another artist named Lee Krasner. And at oftentimes he was uh, misunderstood by the art world and he was a uh, of, of great controversy in the 1950s about whether or not this is actual art. As I look at this painting, uh, I want you to see that these layers, they literally compete for attention with the forgotten and unfinished underneath. So the artist is letting only some of the white canvas show through. There's layers of complicated, um, uh, emotions here. Convergence is the title. It was quietly purchased by the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, New York in 1956, just five months before Pollock died in a tragic drunk driving accident on Long Island in New York. Uh, he was married, as I said, to Lee Krasner, who created the Pollock Foundation after his death. Here we have Andy Warhol on the right and his famous Marilyn Monroe screen print portfolio that he created in 1967, a few years after the actress passed away in 1962. Although Warhol's early work focused on post-war America's love affair with consumerism, which explains his obsession with the Campbell soup cans and Coca-Cola bottles. Warhol's most highly prized pieces featured female celebrities. By relying on his signature screen printing techniques to scribble over the iconic features of famous female faces, Warhol was responsible for making these celebrities even more popular in their death. Most of these celebrities that Warhol painted uh, were women that he knew and met at Manhattan's famous nightclub, Studio 54. They were depictions of women and starlets of a time where he explored the relationships between consumer culture, fashion, fame, sensationalism, and death. It is also said that through his distinctive style of work, Warhol referred to a society in which individuals were seen as mere products rather than human beings. In 1998, Orange Marilyn was auctioned at Sotheby's at an evening, of, evening sale of contemporary art. It was estimated to bring in four to six million dollars. It set a new record at $17.3 million, a highest paid price for a Warhol. In 2007, Lemon Marilyn sold for 28 million at Christie's auction house. And in 2014, um, White Marilyn, which was painted in 1962, sold for $41 million at Christie's auction house. I'll bring us to our last piece, which was painted in the 1980s by another artist that spent most of his time in New York, although he was born in Cutstown, Pennsylvania, and that is Keith Haring. 
Keith Haring was uh, an artist that moved to New York City to go to an art school. Uh, he did not finish uh, his degree, but he did notice that there were many advertisement boards in the subways that were left blank. After one uh, advertisement was removed, there often was a blank or black sort of um, bulletin board that was free and exposed. And Keith Haring took that as an opportunity to create these very fast, impulsive, graffiti-like pieces of subway drawings. And they became known throughout New York City, um, very, very popular, very famous, very colorful. He believed that everyone should be able to appreciate art and it drew people, he drew people of all colors equally, all races, all different colors, genders. Um, he had, he was political and social in his messages. They revolved around equal rights um, for all people. He even used, he was involved with a lot of charity. He used his artwork very freely during the AIDS, um, war against AIDS in the 1980s and for different publications for the Gay Men's Health Crisis Center for the AIDS Walk New York. Um, and he particularly had an interest in helping in children's hospitals. So often you'll see Keith Haring's art being used in that capacity. Um, he frequently held drawing workshops, both within schools and at museums for children around the world. He opened a pop shop in uh, the Lower East Side in New York in the 1980s. Um, his work is still very recognizable, still very famous. Um, sadly, Keith Haring did die of AIDS uh, in the late 1980s, but his work is nonetheless seen as a masterpiece. I thank you so much for listening to this lecture. I hope now that you'll have a broad understanding of some of the art pieces that I walked you through. And again, thank you very much and have a nice night.